Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Z Learning right here at Riverbank Zoo and Garden. My name is Milo, and today we are here inside of our aquarium and reptile complex for a very, very special feature. We actually haven't done this species yet for Z Learning, so I'm very excited because this animal are leaf-tailed geckos. You can notice it in the caption already, or our teaser post, the video that we shared yesterday afternoon. But Today we are going to be talking about probably our most common animal here at Riverbanks, which is weird to say. I know a lot of times when you hear Riverbanks, you don't immediately think of leaf-tailed geckos, but as far as numbers are concerned, we have over 400, yes, you heard me right, 400, over 400 leaf-tailed geckos right here on site at Riverbanks, which means that they are either the most or one of the most populous animal species that we have here in our collection, in our Riverbanks family. But good morning, everybody. It's so nice to see all of you tuning in. Walker, Maddie, good morning, Tiffany, Laura and Ariel, nice to see you all tuning in. Gunner and Chase, nice to see you as well. Jamie, oh, good morning, Caitlin and Pam, nice to see all of you tuning in live for Z Learning this morning. I was just explaining that we have a whole lot of these leaf-tailed geckos. In fact, we have a whole lot to share with them too. You might notice in the caption today that we've had over 2,000, it's actually closer to 2,300 hatchlings that were hatched right here at Riverbanks, which is amazing. Let me go ahead and turn around the camera quick because I wanna go ahead and show you where I'm standing in front of. I'm in front of our leaf-tailed gecko on habitat area. Now we have numerous different species of leaf-tailed geckos and we're gonna be joined by Sean, one of our herpetologist staff. And he actually is kind of the, let's say the in-house expert and actually the expert all around the country and globe on leaf-tailed geckos. Now right now it might be a little harder to see with that glare that we're getting. Obviously you can see our camera right here. But here in a second, we're going to head behind the scenes with Sean. He's going to join us, and we're going to have a very unobstructed view of our leaf-tailed geckos. In fact, we're actually going to have our first view be on the other side of this habitat to see what it looks like from an inside view. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Elizabeth, thanks for sharing it with your first grade class. We'd love to hear that. Good morning, David, Catherine, Chaz. Happy 11th birthday. Thanks for tuning in for Z Learning. Sarah Grace, nice to see you too. And Sarah, thanks so much. I'm glad you like my mask. I will say though, if you head on over to riverbanks.org, we actually have our own Riverbanks masks that are available for pre-order. So if you just head to riverbanks.org, head on over to our shop and you can get one kind of similar to this. But good morning, everybody. It's so nice to see you. We're gonna start making our way back behind the scenes. Like I said, we are here in our aquarium and reptile complex. Hopefully you're still able to hear me with my big mask on. We're gonna kind of slide back behind the scenes and here in a second, we're gonna turn around that camera and say a big old good morning to Sean. Now you might recognize Sean, he joined us for our alligator feeding. Let's go ahead, turn it around and say good morning. Morning everybody. Sean, so nice to see you. Now we of course could not have done this feature without you. Like I said, you are the in-house expert. You know what you're talking about when it comes to leaf-tailed geckos. And for those of you who are kind of along with the ride, we just did a big horseshoe and now we're at the back of the habitat. So what we were just looking at on the other side, Sean, do you actually mind opening it up? Let's take a yeah, peek. We can uh, take a peek in here. So this is the back side of the exhibit. <laughs> and you can see there's a, a gecko right there. And this is a, a male Hinkle's leaf tailed gecko. Wow, so look he was how just fascinating. hanging out on that door. So how many individuals do we have here in this habitat, would you say? Uh, how many about? Uh, I'm just going to guess 10 or so. Of 10 so species. individuals? Yeah. Some okay. are very small and you almost never see them. But uh, some of these bigger species, there's only a handful of those. Gotcha. Because um, they take up more space. But then we also have some day geckos in here and a few small leaf-tailed geckos that are really small. See, so I see a day gecko up here, a little out of oh, shot. Oh, yeah, there's a... Here, let's go ahead and kind of pan up. Here's another type of gecko. We're not going to focus on the day gecko so much today. <laughs> Zipped out of view. We're going to specifically be focusing on those leaf tail geckos. Now, Sean, when you had that individual in your hand, those of you who are tuning in, you saw that tail. You know exactly why they get that name. It's, of course, because it's a leafy-like tail. Now, why do they have that kind of design, Sean? So, leaf tail geckos are masters of camouflage. Mm. And their color patterns mix in really well with the barks of trees. Uh, they have some species like that. Hinkles that we were looking at have a fringe underneath 
their jaw along their body and they can flatten that out on a tree trunk and their tail flattens out and they almost completely disappear so they're just perfect um, masters of camouflage. That is such a good point. They really are masters of disguise. Stevie, great question. Are they endangered? It's hard to say that leaf-tailed geckos are endangered in general. There are some species that are considered endangered. Sure. Most are considered just of uh, vulnerable or least concern. It depends on the species, which Absolutely. part of the forest they're from. Some are found in very, very localized uh, portions of forest and those are the ones that are in most endangered. That is such a good point. So there are numerous different species and varieties of leaf-tailed geckos. In fact, we have quite a handful here, but as far as zoos are concerned and our breeding program for them, we are by far the most successful here in the country, if not the world. In fact, we have the largest collection of leaf-tailed geckos here in the United States. Now, Sean, we're kind of getting a, a, a disguised view. Let's go ahead, I'm gonna follow you. I know we're behind the scenes right now in our aquarium and reptile complex. So we're getting kind of that backdoor view. We're gonna go ahead and follow you all the way down the hallway as we make our way. As we're following Sean, we're gonna kind of head through our behind the scenes area that's for a little bit of aquarium and a little bit of reptile as well. And here, let's go ahead and turn around the camera. So we'll stop at this. This is actually one of our breeding enclosures. So this is the largest species of leaf-tailed gecko. This is considered the white-eyed giant leaf-tailed gecko. Holy so smokes. it's one of the largest geckos in the entire world. They can get over 14 inches long. They're just Whoa. a massive uh, gecko. They're just in incredibly uh, cool lizards. Take a look at that eye. Okay, so you can kind of see that fringe that Sean was talking about, that camouflage. It kind of blends in has that great mimicry to camouflage into their natural habitat. Obviously, they're not very well camouflaged back behind the scenes here. <laughs> no, he thinks he's on probably a branch or something <laughs> where he's protected, wasn't expecting humans to come along. But yeah, you can see this fringe along here. It's very soft. Their skin is very soft. It's along here. It actually goes along their legs. And then this, you can see the tail. Sometimes their legs are tucked up underneath there. Um, it's just perfect camouflage. And then this tail is actually used for communication as well. Really? So when they're hunting insects, you'll see it wave around like a flag. When males are interested in a female, they'll wave it. And the females, if they're not interested, will wave back and they can actually vocalize wow. a little bit. Um, it's really uh, all kinds of cool behaviors that you Sean, can see. Sean, I actually that. had no idea about that. I did not know that they communicated with their tails. That is absolutely fascinating. So I'm guessing they don't do a ton of vocalizations. Are they a pretty noisy animal or more quiet? They're very quiet during the day, but at night um, you can hear some kind of like croaks and squeals depending on what's happening. <laughs> if a female is unreceptive or two males are in the same territory, sure. they can vocalize and let each other know that you need to get out of this spot because I'm here. Or if a female doesn't want a male, she will let him know. That's um, also another so, good point. You mentioned that they're more active at night. So they are a completely nocturnal group of animals, which means when you do come here to Riverbanks, maybe not during our temporary closure, but you notice that they're pretty inactive or they're going to be kind of hanging out, blending in, camouflaging. They're much more active in the evening. Now we do have a couple other individuals in here. Here, let's go ahead and kind of pan over. So this is the male view. right here that we were looking at. Yep. And then you'll see um, this female here. So this is our female that's hanging out over up on top. So another interesting aspect with geckos, see you can compare her tail to that male, see how hers is shorter and rounder? Yeah, oh, This absolutely. is a tail that is regenerated. So at some point she lost this tail. It was um, for whatever reason. They can, sure. It can be bitten off by another gecko or if they're stressed or if a predator is, was chasing them, they could drop that tail. It has a breaking point right here at the end and the whole tail just drops off. Wow. So when it so regenerates, regrown. it doesn't look quite as nice as the original tail, but um, it still has that different colors in it. So we'll still help them to blend in and avoid predation. That is amazing. Now, not all lizards can necessarily do that, but definitely these species of geckos. What an amazing adaptation, because of course, losing a tail is much better than losing your entire life to a predator. So it's a great adaptation to help survive. Now. Sean, where are these animals actually found out in the wild? 
So you're gonna find leaf tail geckos in Madagascar and that's the only place you're gonna find them. And they are found in various forest tracks throughout the island. Um, Madagascar is mostly deforested, so their habitat is very much imperiled and very fragmented. So that's one of the reasons zoos work with these species is because um, they're it's very uncertain what's going to happen Sorry. to these populations going forward. Um, as long as their forests are preserved, we think that they're going to be okay and survive. Absolutely. Um, so they're definitely a vulnerable species just in the sense that they are only found on the island of Madagascar. So they really truly are at risk for whatever happens to the island and those fragmented habitats as well. What a fascinating thing. A lot of people are really curious about their eyes. They have a very kind of mm -hmm. unique appearance to their eyes, kind of unique texture. Why is that, Sean? They are so fascinating. Their eyes are very amazing. So uh, many geckos, including leaf tail geckos, do not have an eyelid like we do. And you can see, so there's no eyelid. You can just see around the skin flap there. And then you ha see this clear, hard um, lens that's over that. That's called a spectacle and that protects their eye. Um, they have a really long fleshy tongue that they can actually stick out <laughs> and clean that eye, that spectacle, kind of like a windshield wiper. Wow. Um, <laughs> but yeah, their eyes are really neat. This particular species, you can see the concentric rings in the eye, and that lets you know which species this is. Most of them do not have those little kind of orangey um, concentric rings within within the iris of the eye. So that, that lets you know what species it is. That is so interesting. Well, I just saw a question come through. Cassidy was wondering, do they have good vision? They can't see great during the day. Sure. Because if you see in the very center of that eye, that little thin black line, yeah, that's their pupil. Whoa. So at night, all you see is black. It's the pupil is full and they can see very well at night and that's when they're active and that's when they're hunting. So when we put crickets in here at night for them to eat, they immediately see those and they run down and jump and grab those. So at night they have great vision. Great question, Cassie. I'm glad you asked. Here, let's go ahead and kind of zoom out. Sean, we'll go ahead and kind of follow you. We'll go ahead and close back up this area. Once again, we are behind the scenes over here in our aquarium and reptile complex. I'm joined by Sean, one of our herpetologists, who is our in-house leaf-tailed gecko expert. And it's not, of course, the only animals he takes care of, but they are a very unique resident here at Riverbanks. And now we're over here. Let me go ahead and turn the camera back around to give you all a perspective. We have a couple of different habitats back here. What so are we looking what at? we're looking at here with these glass aquariums, these are yeah. geckos that have been raised up, hatched here, and we are either going to incorporate these into our own breeding program, or all of these will be going out to other zoos. For instance, this, these three geckos in this enclosure are all gonna go to Bermuda Aquarium. Whoa, okay, so one more time, those of you who might've missed that. These three individuals that are right here in this behind the scenes habitat are actually getting ready, they're preparing, obviously when it is safe to do so, to actually head to the island of Bermuda to another AZ accredited facility over there on the island. So we do a whole lot of work with other institutions, not only just here in the United States and locally, but also all around the world. In fact, not too long ago, wasn't there a big shipment that headed over to England? <laughs> we did, we sent 30 pairs of these Hinkle's leaf tail geckos, like, uh, we'll look at this girl here. So we sent 30 pairs of this species to the Chester Zoo in England, and they then distributed those geckos to many institutions all over Europe. That and it has really kick-started their program, and those geckos over there have started breeding and producing offspring. How cool. And they've started their own program for this species. It was just approved in the last uh, several months. So now they'll be able to breed those geckos and if we ever need some of those genetics to come back to the U.S., we can exchange bloodlines. And so that's, that's really cool because this is a vulnerable species. These are no longer exported from Madagascar. So the only way you can get this species is from captive-born individuals. Well, that is so interesting. It's all about that teamwork to help create those sustainable populations in human care. In fact, Sean, you mentioned that you had kind of a transport plan or kind of that breeding plan. Do you want to go ahead and show us that real quick, actually? 
so we I work with a population biologist. Yep. And that person helps me to come up with a plan of which geckos need to breed with which geckos. So I print it out and it comes out with all of these numbers, which looks kind of confusing. And it looks like a whole different language. But up here, <laughs> this is gonna be all the females. So this is their ID number. And then down here will be the males. This And these are their ID numbers. And then every number through here, you'll see a one through a six or a dash. One is the best, so that would be a great breeding. That's best for genetics, for demographics, everything. If it's a six, that's bad. That means they're probably brother and sister. Sure. Um, and the dash is also bad. So really one, two, three, and up to four, those can be okay breedings. Anything above that, we do not breed. Wow. So it is all the science that goes in behind the scenes. It's not just by happenstance, there's a whole lot of work that goes into creating these sustainable populations. And like I mentioned at the beginning of this feature, we are wildly successful. In fact, we've had over 2,300 leaf-tail geckos hatch right here at Riverbanks. So a good majority of the leaf-tail geckos all around the globe probably have roots or some sort of heritage lineage right back here to Riverbanks in Columbia, South Carolina. That's fascinating. I'm so glad you showed us that, Sean. So all of that work, of course, you work with the population manager, you get all the plan, you potentially do all the shipments, these individuals heading to Bermuda, but of course it has to start with an egg, doesn't it? it, it does, <laughs> I was gonna yeah. say. You gotta have the eggs first. You have to have the eggs before the you can have the big numbers right. and all of the sustainable populations. So those of you who are tuning in, Sean's actually going to pull out or pull down some of our eggs that are currently, I guess, incubating. These are incubating. We can just do them right at the temperature that's back here. We have a little temperature uh, gauge up there and you can see it's 66 to 78 degrees back here. It's pretty uh, comfortable. <laughs> you think Madagascar are really hot and humid, which yeah. it is in areas, but these geckos tend to be a little more montane, so they're at higher elevation levels, huh. so it's cooler where they tend to be from, so it has to stay a little bit cooler here, but we can just incubate these eggs right at the temperature. Whoa, look at here. all of those eggs. Okay, so no wonder we are so successful. So. All of these different eggs, are they the same species of leaf-tailed gecko or are they different varieties? No, these are different species, so we can so look. Check out, it's all labeled. <laughs> <laughs> so these are gonna be scientific names. So like this says Lineatus, which is the lined leaf-tailed gecko. This says Sicori, that's the mossy leaf-tailed gecko. Fimbriatus, okay. giant leaf-tailed gecko. I have to <laughs> jump in here too quick, because hats off to all the herpetologist staff because y'all are always using scientific names. I know we get used to using common names. We're calling them leaf tail geckos, moths and the leaf tail gecko. But Sean, you use them actually for their scientific name. <laughs> when so we're remember... talking, we, we say, oh, I got two Fimbriatus eggs today. So Fascinating. But that's the giant leaf tail gecko. Yeah, and it's easier. And we'll have the, the male's number right here, which for this one is 14341. Then you have the female's number and then the date that the eggs were laid. Wow. And it's going to take anywhere from four to six months for these to hatch. And it just okay. depends on the temperature back here. So in the summer, it's going to be a little bit warmer. So the eggs tend to hatch a little bit quicker. Sure. Uh, during the winter, it's going to uh, take the eggs a little bit longer. To so hatch. then the eggs hang out in here all that time then, of course, to incubate. Then how often are you checking them to see if there's baby geckos that have we actually hatched? Check every, every morning we open these okay. up. We kind of know when they're gonna hatch. Sure. So, yep. um, you have it almost on, like on a calendar. You kind of know, right. the, let's say, the due date of sorts. Exactly. So you kind of monitor. Obviously, these were from the larger species, but these are eggs from some of the smaller species. So you can see how tiny these little eggs are compared to the others. Look at those itsy bitsy eggs. And so leaf-tailed geckos. We saw the largest species over there. In a second, we'll look at the smallest species. So these are eggs from spear point leaf-tailed geckos mostly and then there's some satanic leaf tail gecko eggs in here as well now so the spear point are those the smallest species that then? is considered the smallest species wow and now but there's a lot in that little group of uh little guys they're all about three inches long so those of you who are tuning in i know it's kind of hard to kind of get a size comparison i would say these are like big peas or maybe like small marbles basically like a pea yeah. they really are like pea size they're very speckly though they're kind of blended in great camouflage of course adults and in eggs now, Sean, okay, so once they hatch then, they are fully independent. They don't have any parental care, is that true? That's correct. As soon as they hatch, they're, they rely on their camouflage to avoid predators. There's no 
taken care of by mom and dad. They're yeah. just on their own and they just go about their business. So Deanna, since you were wondering how many days does it take before they hatch, Sean said it takes anywhere from what, four to six months, About did you four say? to six months is average. Jeez Louise, okay, so that's a pretty long time, especially considering how small these eggs are. But when they hatch, they are fully self-sufficient. They're ready to go hunting and survive out on their own. So Sean, why don't we take a peek actually of what they look like size-wise about when they hatch. I know you, you kind of prepped a couple of individuals for us. So these are spear point leaf tail geckos. This is an adult female that hatched here over a year ago. Well, wait a second. Okay, so adult, full grown, that's all this the bigger is, she is she going is to get. She is full grown and you can look at that tail and obviously that's why they call them spear point leaf tail geckos. It's just that little tiny point right there. Okay, so I have to pause one more time again. These are masters of disguise. Now she might not look like a green leaf, but she absolutely looks like a crinkled up dried leaf. Right, and you can see that line going down there, right there, the line's going, it looks like a dead leaf basically. It really, so really does. When you see these guys in a group of leaves, <laughs> it is very, very difficult to actually find them. And now you can see this little guy. This is not a hatchling, but this one is probably Whoa. about two months old. Okay, we're zooming in a little bit. So this is uh, one, of our, one of our younger ones, but you can see- Look at how tiny, how that, tiny little that little guy is. is. How amazing, Sean. So how old did you say this individual was? this one's was? already probably two to three months old. So you can imagine how tiny they are. I was gonna say, growing, developing, everything. So he's probably about five times bigger than when they hatch out. That is so cool. And they are so adapted to being up in the trees, climbing all around. They make it look effortless the way they're jumping all around <laughs> or climbing up Sean's arm right now. Once again, we're looking at one of these, the smallest species of leaf tail gecko, our spear point leaf tail geckos right here. This tiny little individual. Let's zoom in as they keep zooming around too. <laughs> Cindy, this absolutely is a baby. This one will grow up to be about the size of that female that's hanging out over here in the back that Sean had in hand just a second ago. Now, of course, these buckets are just a temporary little area for where they're hanging out. And of course, they're gonna be returned back to their habitats here in a second. We just wanted to give you all a very up close view. But Sean, you have another surprise for us. <laughs> We've actually got a couple more little guys. So this is actually about a less than a month old giant leaf tail gecko. You can see she's all spread out thinking she's protected and in, in everything. Um, but you can see they're basically an exact replica of the adults, just Oh, they so really are. You can see the fringe, yeah. that leafy tail too. And you can, yeah, that tail that they use, that fringe underneath, it's quite amazing. It's truly just a and miniature version. And if you version. look underneath, do you see those white patches underneath? Yeah, I do, in? yep. So those are calcium sacs. Really? So they use those calcium sacs, they draw on those throughout their life to grow. Uh, females need those calcium sacs to produce eggs. So, so it's almost like a resource of nutrients is kind of like where they keep their vitamins, minerals exactly. <laughs> all that's stored up so that way they can use them. That's why we have to make sure that they're getting plenty of calcium and what vitamins in their diet. Fascinating. God, that is such a tiny little individual. You can see it just on the edge of Sean's fingertip. <laughs> okay, now you had another species in here too. Is it a different variety of leaf tail yeah, gecko? This is actually a uh, Hinkles, but this one is a, a juvenile. So this guy's about a third grown, um, and this is a male. We'll eventually incorporate him into our own breeding program, or he'll go to another zoo. But you can see, really see that fringe underneath his. I was gonna say it almost looks like a Santa Claus yeah, beard that he has. That. Wow, and that, that's just a flap of skin, scaly that's, skin. Mm -hmm. yep, what a great adaptation a to skin. disguise. Now, those of you who are tuning in live, if you check out our caption today, our caption is all about masters of disguise. This camouflage is probably not working very well behind the scenes, but out in the wild in Madagascar, this would help them survive and thrive out in their habitat. So we encourage you to get outside, explore, and look to see what kind of camouflage you might be able to find in your backyard too. Sean, they are absolutely amazing. Oh, good question from Ashley. How can you tell if they're male or female? Is there a size difference? No, I can, it's better if I show. Sure. And we'll, I'll show you that girl that we had out. So you can see it's nice and flat right here. Sure, That's yep. a girl. So female, gecko, 
Now these are in those habitats, those kind of glass terrariums. And we have a and so male, male right here. Very rounded here. You can see it's not flat like that female. Gotcha. And he also has these little spurs right here. And you won't see those large spurs in females. Fascinating. So there so is that's how you tell boys and girls. Absolutely. Work. So there is definitely a difference, especially when you can see them through the glass. It's a much easier way to kind of tell who's who. And now, Sean, I have been getting a question that I, I've noticed come through a couple of different times. A lot of people are wondering if they make good pets. What's kind of your opinion on that or kind of your best piece of advice from Riverbanks? So for the average person, these do not make good pets because they have specialized care. Absolutely. There definitely are uh, people out there that keep them, um, private breeders that know how to take care of them sure. and can give the specialized care. And so those are the people that can keep these as pets, um, but the general person is not probably going to be able to give them the specialized care that they need. No, that absolutely makes perfect sense. So obviously they're not a domestic species, say like your cats or dogs at home, they're not going to be cuddly or anything like that. They don't really crave our attention. Obviously Sean's been demonstrating very well that they're pretty handleable animals, but other than just kind of a quick once over to see how they're doing, we let them be geckos and they get to hang out in their groupings do their own hunting and all that sort of good stuff. So we don't cuddle our geckos here at the zoo by any means, but I've been noticing that question come through quite a lot. I wanted to go ahead and mention that quick. Now, once again, this is just kind of a quick little snapshot. Like I said in the beginning, we have over 400 different leaf-tailed geckos right here, right now at Riverbanks. It is amazing to see all of these different varieties up close and personal right here at Riverbanks. Sean, this has been fantastic. We've had so much fun hanging out with you <laughs> back here at the geckos. Now, maybe next time when y'all tune in, we might have some new hatchlings. I feel like we're getting hatchlings all the time. How often would you say that we're having new hatchlings arrive? Well, the breeding season just kicked in, as you can see by the box full of eggs. Sometimes we have two boxes full of eggs and we've probably been getting them over the last two months. So in another two months, it, all the hatching will start kicking in. And wow. So it's just an ongoing process. Yeah, it's just it an ongoing. Like. Every year it's uh, kind of the same thing. <laughs> that is fascinating. Well, here, let me go ahead and pan on over. A big thank you, of course, to Sean. You did a fantastic job this morning. We couldn't have done it without you. Thanks for all your amazing hard work for breeding this fascinating species, native to Madagascar and found all over here at Riverbanks. Now, all of you that tuned in live, a huge big thank you for all the great questions. I apologize if we didn't get to every single one of them. We'll hopefully try to find them a little bit later and hopefully comment back to all your fascinating questions. Y'all are rock stars. We absolutely love that you're tuning in live to Z Learning right here at Riverbank Zoo and Garden. But I wanna mention tomorrow, we're gonna go live at 10 a.m., like always, with Z Learning. And we're actually gonna be exploring around the aquarium. It's gonna be a nice relaxing pause to the week. So that way you can all join me underwater, under the sea, for a nice midweek relaxation session. It is so nice to see all of you still commenting in. Thank you all for tuning in, and we'll see you tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Bye, everybody.